Right now, it's Steve Lamack. I mean, we've been trying to do this for about 20 years, I think, <laughs> so uh, it's lovely to be here. What I like about this collection of bands, and they all seem to share something, but they're all very different in their own way, I think. I mean, I think the way, the, the way a band like Life look at, uh, look at the world is slightly different to the way Idols or Fontaines do, but they all definitely have, they, they, I think they, they would all like to reach people. I mean, they'd all like to find that, you know that point where you're listening to a song and you think, oh, I really get that and it's saying something like which you've been waiting for somebody to say for ages but they're all they're all really different I mean Idols Idols I saw for the first time February 2016 at the Thetler in Bristol somebody had played me a track by Idols the previous day and um, so I thought I'll, I'll, I'll go down to this I'll go down to this gig and about three or four songs in the guitarists were messing about essentially you know tuning up and but taking their time about it and Joe looks at one guitarist and then Joe looks at the other guitarist and then Joe looked back to the audience and Joe said I fucking hate this band and I fell in love with Idols and um, about two hours later after the gig finished I was in a pub in Bristol called um, The Mother's Ruin which is one of the places where bands tend to go and uh, I, I went over to, I had a fanboy moment and went over to Joe and said look oh, I thought your band was really good and we just started chatting away and uh, Bowen and, and Joe and you know, they were really lovely people and we kept in touch and then they sent us the demos for the first album and I remember um, you know just, uh, just listening to it, marching around the house listening to it or in, in singing it in my head and it was only recently that um, uh, my other half uh, said uh, I can remember what you said when you first properly listened to that Idols record which is finally someone is writing, someone is making the music that says all the things that are going on in your head. And I think the sort of, you know, the chaos in your, in, in your head, the thoughts, if somebody comes along and unjumbles those, or finds, and this is the greatest songwriting ability, is being able to find the words for the things that you can't find the words for, Joe Tolbert's got that, and all these bands to a certain extent have got it. But the great thing about Idols is they are just, it's the way they write as well, almost in mantras, they write like they're having a conversation, they write like that thing, you know when you're having an argument, you're, you're doing the argument in your head of what's going to be the argument you have, and uh, so, or you just think, oh, I really hate this, I really hate this, and that's how he writes. He doesn't say I really hate this and tries to find something to rhyme with it. So he's very, he's very clever. Idols and certainly life, and bands like that as well are speaking for the people who can't speak. You know, they're in a band saying things that the people who are just like them who aren't in bands, you know, they're, they're a voice for people. In a climate where, you know, there is a certain blueprint that bands sometimes have for this is how you make it, idols have just done it in their own way. Without compromising, they have, they have just been, you know, decent blokes, worked very hard, worked harder still, and they've, they've that, as much as anything else, makes them really important. It shows, it shows people that, look, you can do it in a good way. You don't have to be an absolute uh, egotistical bastard to become, a, to become a pop star, you know. And think about the people who come to see you and building that. The Idol, Idols thing is, you know, it's such a massive community now that you get the, the Idols Facebook uh, page, which was set up by fans, um, where, which is now sort of its own self-help group. It's not just, it's about, you know, people sharing their love for the band. It's about people making things happen. And that, through the music of Idols, you've now got this completely di different, separate thing, where people are getting on and doing stuff and creating stuff, and if somebody's down, somebody on that group will pull them back up again. Fontaine's DC is an amazing, I think the thing about Fontaine's DC is taking a bleakish sort of landscape and then turning it into a piece of poetry, which is just, a, I mean, taking a black and white photo of Dublin and colouring it in. I mean, not glamorising it, just saying this is, the, this is the reality, but making the reality sound sort of special uh, to the point where you're interested in it. and. Want and, and then really fascinated by it. I mean, just the, I don't know, just their, just the, just the way they write about who they are and what they'd like to be. I think, I think if you're really into a band, like really into a band, you, 
you're investing something in that band, aren't you? I think. I mean, I think when you, I mean, if you're quite, I mean, obviously in the, in the old days when you're quite young, you're always going to stick up for that band in an argument, aren't you? If somebody say, oh, they're rubbish, I mean, no, they're not. But that band's, I mean, I mean, I've said it before, but unfortunately, 99% of bands will let you down at some point. Because the thing is, you start mistaking the fact that, because if a band writes something and you think, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I feel. God, that, that could be me, that. And, you know, they, they do that two or three times. And then you read an interview with them, and you think, oh, yeah, that's, that, that could be me, that's amazing. But you see, we then superimpose ourselves on that person. So we start believing that they are us. But they're not us, so eventually they'll do something which you wouldn't do, and therefore you'll go, what are they doing? I wouldn't have done that. And then you'll, you suddenly feel quite let, quite let down, and you spend money, don't you? You have, a, you have a day off work to go to the gig, or you send off for something. You know, you're all about them, but you feel, the thing is, you feel part of that band, you feel part of that family. And if that family turn around uh, at some point and um, you know, uh, do something which you find reprehensible in some way or annoying, then it's disappointing, isn't it? In the one man show, there's, well, I do a, a list of things, ways that bands will let you down. First of all, the songwriting partnership, which is the core of the group, well, they'll fall out with each other. Your favourite member of the band will leave. They'll stop doing gigs just when you need them, just when you've split up with somebody after seven years and you're desperate to go and see their gig. They'll go on a two-year hiatus. And when they come back, then they'll tell you that the favourite song that you, of yours, which they always do, they're never going to play again. <laughs> and then after all this, they'll employ, um, they'll employ a pointless keyboard player. For no reason. I mean, bands invent... I mean, just new ways the whole time, yeah. just to infuriate you. Right. And, and then they'll just go and split up. <laughs> you know, after you've followed them for five years religiously and done everything you can. They'll just, they'll just like it's nothing. I mean, it might be nothing to you, but it's, you know, it's quite a big deal to us. You know, the band who do put out a 25th anniversary edition of an album, which, you know, remastered. Well, it's like a remastered book, this, you know, with some additional material and some new photos. Yeah. It's just like putting out your debut album. You have a different perspective, I think, if you work in the industry. It's the only thing which separates me from uh, other music fans. Well, that separates the people in the media from people who aren't in the media or are music fans, because obviously you are privy to loads of stuff, you know, and you know how certain things work. To a certain extent, that can make you, at times, slightly more cynical than possibly an average music fan. If I, was, if I wasn't working in the industry, I'd had unconditional love for certain music and stuff, and I wouldn't care how it worked. Um, you do take on a lot of, when you're in the industry, you fight other people's battles quite, you know, sometimes, you know, and you're really going head to head over the stupid arguments of, of surrounding playlists at radio stations and stuff. So it's different. So you just have a slightly different viewpoint. But I mean, I've, I've done, I've done a lot of things outside of, which aren't sort of media related, I suppose. You know, we started Deceptive Records in the 90s, although that was, that was partly just to prove to the majors that you could do, you could put out records in a different way and you could do, you know, sensibly try and do a, a record label which had some principles and did, went about things in a different way. The reason I started a fanzine when I was 16, 17 was because I, I, I was listening to bands that the music press weren't writing about. So that's why everyone started fanzines, I think. And you wanted to, you wanted to have your own voice, whether it was about music and there was a bit of politics and stuff. But I started that because I wanted to, I suppose, ridiculous. Again, it sounds, I mean, it sounds pompous almost. But I wanted to make some sort of difference. And starting a fanzine was the only thing I could, I could do. I couldn't play an instrument or anything. So you start a fanzine, and then um, eventually you join a, you know, I joined uh, a music paper, and you could. You could write a single review and make a different. A band might sell, you know, an extra 200 copies, so you're making a difference. And then by the time you get to uh, into radio, and while we, when we were at Radio One, I think we did help break some bands. You know, we did we did alter, you know, the course of pop music history a little bit by just giving people a little platform at the start. I mean, I don't think we ever, you know, really. I don't think we can't invent a band. You can't make a band famous. Uh, you can give them the, the, the ability to get to reach people. But, I mean, you can't. I mean, if we could just, if it was as easy as just playing the record, and making people famous, I mean, I'd have, 
we'd have, we'd be doing it every week, and um, you know. But there's a litany of bands who I've loved and played who didn't come anywhere close to being famous. But but it was it's about making a difference. I mean that's the thing. That's why I, that's part of the reason why I stay. John Peel, when uh, when I got uh, the evening session was axed, um, I went to talk to Peel because obviously I was quite. I mean, I was gutted, obviously, for a start. I mean, I was quite uh, upset and quite angry. And I spoke to John, and I got the impression, because obviously John had, you know, had shows, had the take shows taken away and everything. I just got the impression from him that even if Radio 1 had said, right, we're going to bin off that show and that show, and you're just going to have 15 minutes a week on Radio 1, I get the impression he would have still had those 15 minutes, because in those 15 minutes he could play something which he thought was worthwhile and might change somebody's life. And so staying in the game, I think, and staying in the media is, that's, that's sort of why I'm still there, really. I mean, it's a just, it's a daft crusade, you know, but, you know, it's the only one I've got. Well, there's a couple of reasons, really. I mean, one is there's always going to be two or three American bands that you that you've heard but not seen live. I mean, I'm 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 very much of a mind that before you can really bang on about a band, before you can really enthuse about a band, you have to see them live to make sure that they have more than two good songs and that right. they can pull it off live. Um, seeing a band is really important. If a band's not touring Britain for another nine months. You know, it's worth it coming out here. Plus, you'll find things which you've never heard before, even in this stone age of the internet, and you know, people sending you MP3s and stuff from all over the place. You know, there's bands who you find here that you, know, you, you just wouldn't have come across. And also, I mean, one of the things I like about going to see new bands, and particularly, I mean, here it's fantastic because you can't go and see five bands, five different bands in a night back in London. I mean, I spend a lot of my time looking for bands that I think I'll. I'll like or our listeners will like, but every so often you'll just see something and go, oh, man, I would never have gone to see that. The thing, I suppose, the main thing that's changed is there's, there's probably less completely unknown unsigned acts. I think you, I mean, a decade ago or more, um, well, actually, back in the noughties, I remember, I think it was the second year I came, second or third year I came, and I'd done a lot of research, because the first year I came, I didn't know anything, I didn't know what it was going to be like, I hadn't listened to any bands, I stood in the middle of Sixth Street on my third day here going, I don't know what to do, I don't know where to go, I don't know who's on, I don't know anything, and I felt so useless that the next year, I mean, I spent two weeks um, prepping for it. So I went through and listened to a load of stuff and came across this band and they were the f we came over on the Wednesday, they were the first band I went to see on the Wednesday evening uh, without a record deal, nothing. I don't think they even had a manager at the time and they just played some, it wasn't even one of the big venues, they just played what looked like a sort of restaurant, corner of a restaurant and they were just brilliant and I went up, up to them uh, at the end of the gig and said look, is there any chance you're coming to Britain and they said yeah we're going to try and sell finance ourselves coming over in about three months and I said as soon as you arrive come and do a session for us and that was We Are Scientists, a completely unknown We Are Scientists brilliant. and I think the, these days, I mean although there's still unsigned bits and pieces here, yeah. by the time bands get to play South by Southwest they've already got some sort of infrastructure behind them and people are using this more as the next level up to do their promo really. Right, they come here right. to launch a single or launch an album or you know do the next bit, whatever that is, getting your European agent. Um, so the actual thrill of finding something at its most raw, you know, which is just formed, right. I think that's less than it probably used to be. You can certainly see the ones who probably are hungrier for it, I think. But also I think the bands who've put a lot of their own cash in or have worked really hard are the ones that really appreciate it when they're out here and they, they, yeah, they do work really well. Most of the bands that I, I know and like or have found here, they do seem to know that this is a big chance. And I think people are increasingly aware of the fact that there's so much competition. You know, you are, you are one band up against 1,999 other bands <laughs> who also want exactly the same thing as you do, probably. So, you know, you've got to try reasonably hard, haven't you? That's why I stopped right where I stood when I saw you.